Hello and welcome to episode 90 of On Liberty, coming to you live from the Center for Independent Studies in Sydney, Australia. I'm your host, Salvatore Babonis, and joining me today is Janet Albrechtson, columnist for the Australian newspaper and all-round force of nature. We'll be talking to Janet about the Australian elections, what to expect from the Labour Party in government, and of course, the colour teal. <laughs> Janet Albrechtson, how are you? I'm very well, thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us today. And I'd like to lead off with your uh, weekend uh, op-ed, uh, actually not an op-ed, I guess your weekend column titled uh, Women Wreck Brutal Revenge on Cynical Morrison. Now, I know authors don't always select their own titles, but <laughs> was this the woman election? Well, it's not the woman election because obviously we make up, you know, just roughly half percent of the population, and we don't, uh, you know, we don't particularly know how women voted on the day. All we can go by, I think, are the polls previously and the result after the election, and I think they point to the fact that uh, the Liberal Party under Scott Morrison was on the nose with many female voters. And they had had different reasons for some. It was climate change, which is, you know, a not necessarily a woman's issue. Um, but I think on other fronts, I don't think Scott Morrison necessarily resonated well with women. And then that is a challenge for the Liberal Party. It's, it's, it's not as if it can't be done, Salvatore. You know, John Howard was able to do it. Um, leaders can do it. You don't need to be a woke bloke to win over women in the Australian community. You just need to, I think, um, talk talk about issues that matter to, to obviously both men and women, but cover off on those issues that I think increasingly women are focusing on in the electorate. Well, as you said, of course, women are half the population, but a lot of analysts do tend to think of, uh, well, women's issues, the woman's vote. Uh, we seem to for somehow make women into a block in a way that we don't for men. No one talks about getting the men's vote or men's issues in elections. Uh, is this really just a, an outdated way to think about elections? Or is it true that uh, you know there are issues that are specifically important to women that Scott Morrison simply failed on? I think the last term of parliament with you know allegations of bullying and harassment and, and sexual assault in some cases, and let me reiterate, allegations, um, I think they did throw up issues to, to women wanting to see a parliament that is more reflective of the workplaces in which women work. I mean, if our parliament, for goodness sake, can't model good behaviour towards women, then I do think that women start to turn away. Look, men and women have turned away from the from the major parties in this election. I, you know, I, I know there's a narrative that this is kind of the passive aggressive election where voters said, oh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're rusted on Liberals, but I'm sick of holding my nose and I'm going to biff you in the face this time. Or I'm a Labor voter, but, you know, I can't quite do it this time. Remember, Labor came out of this election with a primary vote of 32%. Um, in 1996, when Labor lost the 1996 election, they had a primary vote of 39%. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's a biff in the pace to both sides of politics, but it's not really that passive aggressive, is it? Because what you're seeing increasingly is that voters are taking their protest vote where they used to park it in the Senate, now they're parking it in the lower house with a crossbench of, what, 15 um, people, that's quite an extraordinary result. And I think the Teals factor, Salvatore, is particularly female dominated. It's no mistake that how, how many women are coming into parliament as Teal candidates or Teal MPs, um, and they knocked off moderate liberal blokes. Well, I, I was kind of amazed looking at the newspaper coverage, and not only in your newspaper, of the Teal victories to see that just looking at the photos, it wasn't just that the candidates were women, the crowd were women. This was a very much a, a feminist or at least a female outpouring of support. Uh, the most motivated people behind the Teal independent candidates seemed to have been women. I mean, when I saw election workers, when I passed them on the street, it was overwhelmingly women who were canvassing for Teal. Yet I understand that the, the backer behind all this is, is a man. And so, can you tell me a little about uh, Climate 200, its role in this, and, and why isn't it a political party? 
Well, it's, 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 it's not a political party because it doesn't have the structure of a party, but it has funding. Uh, not all its funding comes from Climate 200, but let's talk about that as a kind of, you know, a good kickstart for these female candidates that have, have won. And it's been a terrific win. You can't take anything away from Simon Holmes' accord. He saw, he could, he could smell what was going on in Australian politics with both sides um, of politics. And, and he tapped into that with, I think, um, a, a group of women who were attractive. I live here in Wentworth um, in New South Wales. And yes, the, the women, I, the, the people I saw on the street campaigning for Allegra Spender as the Teal candidate in Wentworth were overwhelmingly female. I don't even recall seeing a single man in one of those Teal t-shirts um, when I'm roaming around here. So it is, I think, a, a, a particular woman's factor in this election. Um, but yes, as you say, run by a very smart and disgruntled for a former Liberal Party member. So you know, he's not alone. I'm sure as much as we say that, um, yes, climate change was the driving issue uh, and the driving issue by people who are very wealthy and don't feel the effects of us transitioning from 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 coal to renewables um, and don't feel the pressures of cost of living rises of inflation and mortgage repayments going up i think that it's there's more to it than just that i, I think in these electorates if you know i can gauge just from mine there were a lot a lot of younger women who may not be as well healed as many of the you know professional middle class women who who were voting teal who also chose to for whatever reason uh, protest against uh, voting for the, the Labour or the Liberal governments, the parties, sorry. My, now, we do have international viewers, and on top of that, my own students in class yesterday didn't know what Teal was. So I do wonder to what extent this is a movement of the very politically engaged and not necessarily um, well known beyond that. Could you explain for, I mean, just give us a, your own take on what this teal movement is, you know, where the teal name comes from, just for our international viewers, our less politically engaged viewers, people who might not know. Yeah, well, it's it's a mix of blue and green, uh, teal. Um, I won't ever be wearing it. <laughs> I don't particularly like the colour teal. Um, uh, but that that's, and again, it's clever marketing to be, to be you know, half green, half blue, and you come up with this teal colour um, because climate change, of course, um, because Simon Holmes, of course, was funding these candidates uh, in large part, or at least in part, um, cl climate change was very central to each of their campaigns. There seem to be, you know, three issues that, that I, can, um, I can glean. The first one, the central one, is climate change. They want more action on climate change. And remember, these are, these are, these are people who won't feel the costs of radical or, or you know, more... Um, uh, bigger action on climate change. The other one is integrity in government, which I find really interesting, actually, because I, I was listening to or reading one of the comments from the Teal M, new Teal MP in Kuyong, who um, managed to boot out our former treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, and she was saying that in her view, corruption that should be um, regulated by an integrity commission or investigated and punished by an integrity commission uh, is anything that uh, amounts to advancing your political interests at the expense of the community. Well, or, that's, or, that's, the, or, or the planet. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really broad definition. And I think it's, it's an irony because what we have at the moment is this kind of community backlash. You saw it in the seat of Fowler where, they, where the Labor Party lobbed Christina Keneally into um, the seat of Fowler. And I think she scored the biggest swing against her as that kind of drop-in candidate that the community rejected and they chose a very much community-minded independent. Um, they will be expected to deliver for their community. At what point is it a community gain and political advancement? I don't think the line is so clear between every every time an MP scores something for their community, they are advancing their political careers. So I, I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation about what an integrity commission is, because clearly these are things that will be put on the table. More action on climate change. There'll be an integrity commission. Labor wants it. The Teals want it. The Greens want it. Um, but this is where the Liberal Party, I think, has a chance to fight back. I don't think we should assume that this is um, that it's written in stone that a, a new government gets two terms in Australia anymore, given what Australia is facing over the next two to three to four years. All right. Um, 
Uh, and on that note, we are a live show. We do take viewer questions. And uh, Christopher wants to ask you, is the obsession with climate change a product of the long term? Uh, might this obsession become victim to any economic downturn? Of course it could, yeah. I mean, um, that that's precisely, I think, what will happen. We, we, we saw it just with petrol prices rising before the election, how much it hurt so many Australians and how quickly the government reacted with a knee-jerk response, you know, by by getting rid of petrol excise for six months or lobbing, 20, lobbing 25 cents off the price of petrol, I think it was. Um, I think what we will see in the next few years because of the economic challenges, because of inflation rising and mortgage stresses and debt that's rising in Australia, and, and no side has any answer for that. So it'll be interesting to see how Labor manages that issue where the cost of borrowing for government will inevitably rise. Um, IR, on the IR front, there are so many challenges that this country faces because I think we've been so complacent. We, even during COVID, we just had so much money thrown at us we've become so complacent about just having money thrown at us that ultimately there has to be a reckoning. And the reckoning will be especially or including in those teal seats where either teal voters start to feel pain also and start to rethink just how wise it was to park their votes with a, um, a very simplistic uh, campaign um, and either they feel the pain or they start to feel guilty for the pain that they've inflicted on poorer Australians. Now, Emily would like to push you back on this a little bit. She asks, um, I find the argument that Teal supporters are quote unquote insulated. Uh, sorry, uh, they're, they're insulated from the affordability issue unconvincing. Aren't these people our hedge fund managers? Sorry, my screen keeps moving. Are these people our hedge fund managers, insurance brokers and captains of industry, implying that they're people who are going to be hit by climate regulation? but they won't be hit in, in anywhere near the extent to if, if your electricity um, price um, bill surges by a third, think about that for, for, for a working class family who, who barely has anything left, left over uh, after, you know, they've paid all the bills at the end of the week. Any surge in electricity prices, any surge in petrol prices, in the cost of living, in their mortgage payments, no, I do believe that there are Australians who will feel much more pain but I've said also that I think some Teal voters were not the well-heeled ones that we generally um, think of in terms of these Teal electorates. But there's no doubt, Salvatore, that the, 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 the electorates where the Teals won are the richer areas of Australia. Right. Wentworth, Kuyong, Goldstein, North Sydney. These, these are much wealthier than, you know, Western Sydney. Do, do you think the Liberal Party will attempt to reclaim those areas or do you think it will shift to become more of a suburban and regional party and uh, just abandon these uh, very affluent coastal seats? I think it would be a mistake to abandon these, you know, that, that line of coastal seats in Australia that has turned teal. It can turn blue again. It really does depend on having a, a leader who can speak to voters in a way that I don't think Scott Morrison was able to. I think it requires a leader who has a conviction around a set of values that I don't believe that Scott Morrison had and the determination to actually have a fight over issues, which I don't think we've seen over the last three years. There were many areas where I believe Scott Morrison simply looked a bit like the other side, where, you know, he wasn't anti-lockdown. He was happy to lock Australians out of the country for, for a Kind of labour light. Labour light spent a, probably the same amount of money that labour would have spent during a pandemic. I don't know that he differentiated himself on climate change enough. I believe that a leader can do that, given, again, what Australia will be facing over the next two to three years. There is an opportunity for a Liberal Party to speak to many parts of Australia in the way that Scott Morrison clearly did not. All right. Now, we have I have lots of questions for you, especially about um, Anthony Albanese in government. But viewers first, and we do have viewer questions just pouring in. So H wants to ask, how, how do we increase the level of political knowledge and engagement, even among so-called educated voters? Uh, so many people seem to vote based on the vibe of a candidate, on likability instead of on the issues. How do we educate voters? Yeah, it's a challenge, isn't it? And I think that is a job for the media. I think in many respects, um, the, the, the Labor um, 
party and the Teal movement in particular didn't get the kind of scrutiny that I believe that it should have had um, in, in terms of the cost of some of its policies, given the challenges that Australia will be facing over the next three years. Um, that is a role for, for the media. I believe that in, in the past, I think the um, papers, including my own, ran much more detailed um, coverage of particular policies. And so that is something we, we can also do. But, you know, people are busy. And in, in many ways, it does rely on the vibe of the thing. I, and I think politics has has been like that for a long, long time. Remember, you know, Kevin 07, I'm, I'm from Queensland and I'm here to help. There is always a vibe to every election. And that vibe matters to a lot of people who are simply too busy to, um, to get into the nitty gritty of, of politics every day. And Salvatore, who would want to who would want to sit and watch Question Time, for example? I mean, sadly, I think politics has turned people off politics because of the way that politics is run in this country. It's increasingly angry. It's increasingly nasty. Um, I find watching Question Time, you know, a real chore. And I don't like the back and forth. I'm, I'm really quite sick of it. I'd like to see, you know, parties act a little bit differently to one another. Now, in America, we have the aphorism that democracy is the theory that the people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. <laughs> Jean, Jean has a question along those lines. Now that the greens and teals are really in the public eye, will the high cost and undesirability of their policy proposals become evident? I think what you, you think about the, um, you know, Labor's got a majority in the lower house. It will be able to get what it wants through the upper house with the Greens. Um, I think it's quite possible that we will see the equivalent of John Howard's work choices moment when the Liberal Party or the Liberal government under John Howard had control over both houses. And, you know, there is a view that they overstepped the mark. They got a bit too excited. The work choices, some of the aspects of the work choices legislation were seen as too radical for the Australian electorate to, to, to accept. Um, and, and for a long time now, industrial relations has been off the agenda for the Liberal Party, which I think is a great shame. But it all dates back to that overreach by the Liberal government on yeah. work choices, right? So I think it's quite possible that we could see Labor in, in, in cahoots with the Teals and the Greens overreach. And that's why I do, I do think it's quite possible that there comes a reckoning um, for the left side of politics. They are now in charge. And everything that happens from now on will be, you know, on on on, on um, will be sheeted back to them. Right now, we do have to get to the actual uh, prospects <laughs> for the Labour Party in government. Um, Anthony Albanese obviously has a big mandate, maybe a, a thin majority, but in the context of recent elections, like this, is almost some kind of. Uh, landslide victory almost. Uh, uh, what does he actually stand for? What is he likely to change with his mandate? Well, he's told us that no one will be left behind. It's quite a big promise, isn't it? I mean, no, I'm looking for, you know, it seems well, like he's made promises everywhere to everyone. I'm kind of looking forward to someone coming over to change my light bulbs because it seems government is going to be doing everything for us from now on. Um, but look, the first thing that he did say on um, um, when he... Um, he accepted victory was that there would be a voice, for example, in the constitution, that he would put that forward to the Australian people. Um, I can't now remember the timing, but I assume it's in, in the, his first term. And uh, that becomes a, a really interesting issue for the Labor government and for the Liberal Party, because I believe this is a test that the Liberal Party can use um, to distinguish itself in a way that it hasn't done enough of. Um, so the voice is a big part of it. Um, industrial relations, um, Anthony Albanese has promised to basically get, you know, not get rid of, but certainly reduce the amount of casual work um, to, to regulate the gig economy, uh, to get rid of labour hire, um, to introduce gender pay equity, whatever that is. And, you know, I, I think gender pay equity is a bit confected, actually, because I believe many, many women work very differently to men, and therefore you see a gender pay gap, a very logical gender pay gap. So if you start institutionalising all of these, again, some people will be hurt. It will cost um, Australians. These are, these are not, co no policy is cost-free. 
Uh, so we'll just wait and see what, what the effects of that are. Now, your colleague, Ben Packham, uh, reported in The Australian this morning that China's foreign minister will be making, I think it's a nine country tour of Pacific Island states, uh, in particular uh, with the potential for another security agreement to supplement the one in the Solomon Islands, maybe one in Kiribati. Uh, with Penny Wong in charge of Australian foreign policy and the China portfolio, is anything likely to change in Australia's response to Chinese expansionism? Well, I would certainly hope not. Um, I think it's really important that we we remain um, strong against China's increasing aggression towards Australia and other Western countries. We're not alone in China imposing penalties and and. and uh, on us trade-wise. But um, I was heartened to hear Jim Chalmers, the incoming Treasurer, yesterday said that the best way that China can mend its relationship with Australia, because there has been some comment that it, you know, it's it's pleased to see a Labor government, uh, whatever that means, that remains to be seen. But for Jim Chalmers to say the best way for China to repair its relationship with Australia is to get rid of the tariffs, get rid of the trade penalties that have been imposed on some of our industries, that's a good sign, I think, coming out of the Labor government. So his position is that China should get rid of these tariffs? Yes, the, or, or you know the various penalties that, have, that they have imposed as retaliation for Australia's in, you know, increasingly um, you know, strong stance against China on a number of fronts, yes. And I wonder if there'll be some tension over that, because I know that you know both Penny Wong and the Deputy uh, uh, Prime Minister, Richard Marles, had, on the campaign trail at least, expressed a desire for Australia to make compromises in its relationship with China. Do you think that represents some internal tension within the, the Labour Party? Well, this is one one of the great challenges for the Labor Party. Not just that it has this, you know, it sits on a, a very small um, primary vote, which can easily change in a couple of years, but that it has its own internal tensions that these big that, that both both sides of politics have. Um, and, and the left and the right in the Labor Party are just as different and warring and full of animosity and hatred as left and right in the Liberal Party. And they do come to fore over these big policy issues like industrial relations um, and, 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 and foreign policy and certainly immigration too. I think they're the three policies to watch for the internal tensions within, within the Labor government over the next three years. Now, I have to admit, I don't follow uh, Australian politics very closely. I hadn't heard of the new treasurer, Jim Chalmers, before he came to office and is now the treasurer. In light of the fact that the Liberal Party uh, under Scott Morrison has run up historic deficits, historic debt, and you could attribute that to COVID, but of course there were other options on the table during COVID. Do you think Chalmers is likely to view that as a free pass that, well, if Liberal can do it, Labor can do it? Or is he likely to have more of a bias towards retrenchment and bring the deficit under control? Well, gosh, you know, I'll sit here and pray that it's the latter, Salvatore, but I fear it's the former because both sides of politics have, as I said earlier during the election campaign, not, sorry, neither side of politics put forward a campaign to bring down that deficit. Um, so the, the the prospect, I guess, of the Labor Party, do, the Labor government doing that, given the promises that they've made in so many areas, from childcare to um, to you know gender pay gap, it, it all costs money. Um, so I guess the prospect of spending coming down under Labor, you'd have to say, is is very very slim. Well, along that lines, I mean, Christopher asks: Is there a growing disconnect between the traditional two parties and their voting? Bases, which I think is another way of asking, have the two traditional parties simply strayed? Have, have they decided on, do they have a new consensus around deficits, around climate change, you know, around social issues that is simply out of touch with either with their traditional base or with their you know, newly emerging voters? I think that's right. I think at the last election, there just wasn't enough differentiation between the two parties. And we're just meant to sit here as grateful voters and say, yes, 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 to this, you know, this sort of cementing consensus in Canberra from both Labor and Liberal on, on, on the big issues. Um, so I think, you know, if I was sitting there as the new leader of the Liberal Party, I, I would look at that um, outcome and think, if we don't stand for something different, we may as well just pack up, you know, um, our, our ball and bat and go home. Because 
if, if you believe in stronger action on climate change, if you want the government to do everything for you, all of these fronts, you're going to vote Labor. But I do believe that there are lots of Australians who don't particularly want that. I think there are a lot of people who understand that there are challenges coming for this nation. And just as we have to budget at home, the government has to budget um, on behalf of us in Canberra. And we don't see enough talk about how a government is spending our money in the right way and getting debt under control. Well, I'm curious, again, as an outsider, why didn't those coastal seats go Labour or Green instead of going Teal? What's the dynamic there? Um, well, it's kind of a nice, you know, easy path from Liberal to Teal, isn't it? Because they've always had the option to go Green. Right. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting that they were, that's how cleverly I think the Teals positioned themselves, that if you can't quite, you know, bring yourself to vote Labor and you certainly don't want to vote Green, um, you can vote for us. So I think it was very much aimed, obviously, as we know, at the Liberal Party because it was aimed against moderates. I mean, the great shame, Salvatore, is that it's taken out a number of moderates in the Liberal Party. And I, I'm a firm believer of the John Howard philosophy of the Liberal Party, which is that it operates best as a broad church. That's the only way that you secure enough votes across the country um, and, and it can be done. It's difficult. But to suggest that we just get rid of the moderate side of the Liberal Party and become more conservative... I think really does cast out a number of Australians who aren't necessarily, you know, in that conservative wing, who just want to hear a party that differentiates itself from Labor um, without, you know, abiding to the sort of more socially conservative uh, side of the, uh, of the Liberal Party philosophy. Right. I have one final viewer question. This was from Emily. Uh, the Business Council of Australia has indicated climate transition is a key economic issue for them. Um, aren't the electorates in the coastal electorates, these elite electorates, well placed to understand the importance of a climate transition to our future prosperity? I think we are, but it all comes down to cost, doesn't it? I'm, I'm not against transitioning from, from coal to renewables. It's all, it all comes down to cost and who wears the pain of that. And is it fair to inflict it on people who, uh, you know, can barely pay their bills as it is? It's all about cost. And to suggest that cost is not part of the equation, again, this is where I think the Teals have gotten away with um, a very simplistic campaign, just asking for, you know, a better climate in Wentworth, for example, what so people are voting because they think that, you know, these candidates are going to bring a better climate to Australia. What is the cost of climate change initiatives? Every single question has to narrow in on that if we're being honest about this policy. And increasingly, we're not. Now, I have questions of my own to ask you, but we have to wrap up. Uh, we are, but in, in, in this show, fan service is the name of the game. <laughs> and so I always go to the viewers before I go to my own questions. Uh, final question, H asks, why is it still not possible for nuclear energy to be discussed in Australia? See, again, such a, such, such a lost opportunity for the Liberal Party. Um, but perhaps under a new leader, that is something, because when we're talking about climate change and we're talking about transitioning away from, from, from coal, that's exactly what we should be talking about. That is part of the long-term uh, debate on, on energy use in Australia. I'm hoping that that does become a serious part of um, the debate and driven by the Liberal Party. Janet Albertson, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, thanks also to our producer, Nico Malian. The director of the Center for Independent Studies is Tom Switzer. I'm Salvatore Babonis. Thank you for watching On Liberty.